Many thanks to the ABIM Choosing Wisely Learning Network Leadership for the opportunity to speak to this esteemed group dedicated to high value care implementation. I'll be talking about the impact of the pandemic on low value care and the potential opportunities it presents to realize a better healthcare system post COVID through reducing or eliminating its use. Much of what I'm covering this session derives from recent work with colleagues at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, including Mark Japinga, Hannah Crook, and Mark McClellan. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge their, their, their great collaboration and encourage anyone who is interested in diving into uh, these issues further to visit our publication in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. As I know this audience is well aware, the U.S. devotes a substantial amount of resources to healthcare every year without commensurate improvements in health outcomes. And while there is a myriad of reasons for why investments in healthcare underperform, one significant contributor is the provision of low value care. Now existing definitions of low value care differ, but it can generally be conceived as care that is medically unnecessary and provides little or no benefit to patients. Examples include the use of lab tests for low risk patients before a low risk surgery, PSA testing for men over age 75, and using an antibiotic for a viral infection among many other services. As you all know, use of low value care in the system is pervasive, amounting to an estimated 100 billion in wasted spending annually. And the implications of this are far reaching from posing uh, physical, mental, and financial harm to patients and their families to wasting limited resources that could be allocated to care that is safer, more effective, more efficient, and of higher quality, or towards other important po uh, policy priorities. Now, use of uh, low value care is not a new problem, of course. Efforts to reduce its use have been introduced over the last couple of decades really with limited success as a result of a complex range of economic, organizational, legal, cultural, and socio-political drivers maintaining um, and facilitating its use in the healthcare system. As we've seen over the last uh, 10 to 12 months, the, the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a dramatic reduction in clinical visits and medical procedures to meet the demands of the initial and, and subsequent surges and to protect the health and safety of staff and, and patients. Understandably, patients have also been reluctant to seek care, even for needed treatment and diagnostic services due to concerns about the virus and, the, and, and just the uncertain economic situation in the country. In March and April, we saw outpatient and elective care up to 60% lower than normal. This decline encompasses uh, clinically indicated care, but also includes low value care. The system-wide uh, disruption and, and resource scarcity brought forth by COVID-19 has provided perhaps the strongest impetus yet for really rethinking how best to prioritize what and how much care to provide to and by whom and in which settings. This is particularly true for low value care given the increased focus on uh, patient harm reduction, expanded opportunities to engage patients via digital platforms, and the implementation of alternative care models or pathways, and in some cases, to deliver care more safely and to patients that, that need it most. The pandemic has also exposed longstanding flaws in our healthcare system. Its fragmentation, inefficiencies, extensive prevalence of chronic illness and glaring health and healthcare disparities. And just how susceptible these weaknesses leave the system and the economy to crisis. While this has certainly showcased uh, that we really can't afford to go back to normal, it duly highlights the need to avail resources to effectively deal with these broader challenges and to prepare for the next crisis. Taken together, the, the current situation presents a rare opportunity to move the needle on reducing low value care and enhance the overall effectiveness and efficiency of the healthcare system. But there is high risk of returning to business as usual, especially with so many healthcare providers under intense financial strain from lost revenues. 
the backlog of elective procedures that have been halted, and just overall pandemic fatigue. As illustrated on the slide, visits for outpatient care, which again had fallen nearly 60% in the early spring, have returned in the past month or so to the levels uh, prior to the, to the pandemic. And so this rebound in, in services just further underscores that there are many strong forces that facilitate the delivery of care that is unnecessary and of limited benefit, even during a pandemic, and that it will not just go away without some concerted awareness and action across all levels of healthcare. So to fully leverage this window of opportunity, um, there are several short and long-term actions that a variety of stakeholders can take to improve individual and population health while deterring a resurgence of low value care. As a first step, providers and health systems can work with patients to develop, to, uh, develop care plans or care blueprints that really weigh the benefits and harms of different therapeutic pathways while also incorporating or considering COVID-19 risk. Existing and emerging, emerging uh, guidance from uh, professional associations and clinical experts can serve as important resources for their development. These care protocols offer an immediate opportunity to spur provider and patient discussion on the harms of unnecessary care. In addition, uh, providers and health systems could develop do not restart lists featuring known low value services that really should not be restarted as health systems reopen. There are a range of resources available to help develop these lists, including the Choosing Wisely recommendation, recommendations, of course, as well as those by the US Preventive Ser uh, Services Task Force, uh, the Task Force on Low Value Care's top five services, and other publicly available tools to help measure and track a range of known uh, low value services. And we outline many of these resources in our Catalyst paper. To support the do not restart list, uh, providers and health systems can encourage guidelines for concordant care and make it easier for physicians and other healthcare professionals to avoid low value services and identify higher value alternatives. Organizations can also integrate appropriate care guidelines into point of care decision supports such as alerts embedded into uh, electronic health records, which would give frontline workers rapid access to evidence-based protocols. Leveraging alternative care pathways and care sites, such as telehealth, home-based care, and community-based care can also help keep patients out of the um, emergency department and other inpatient settings and provide alternatives to low value and wasteful care. Oftentimes, once in the ED or hospital, patients receive unnecessary imaging and lab tests. For example, um, instead of unnecessary imaging or surgery for back or joint pain, patients could receive home-based or telehealth physical therapy, which can be just as, as effective as in-person therapy in many cases. Over time, as more and more services and settings are restarted or reopened, it will be important for pro providers and health systems to measure and track their use of low, low value services. In some current work that we're doing with organizations that have been successful in reducing low value care, one of the most powerful strategies or interventions, if you will, is just alerting providers of their low value care use, ideally comparing it to their peers, and then giving them feedback on how to improve. Equally important is doing so within an environment where low value care reduction is supported by senior leadership and really embedded within a culture of value, trust, and a, lear a learning orientation where uh, providers and other team members are really encouraged and supported to lead and uh, innovate around low value care reduction. In these efforts, providers and health systems will need support from a variety of stakeholders to reduce low value care. Payers play a critical role in making the reduction of wasteful services the right financial decision for providers and health systems. 
payers could decrease or cease payment for low value services in accordance with the do not restart recommendations or other guidelines while increasing reimbursement for high value clinical services. They could also support the development of alternative care strategies by providing short-term payments to offset the costs of practice redesign and any necessary training, while also ensuring access to actionable data to determine whether or not a particular service is necessary and track impacts on outcomes. If these efforts are successful, payers should share savings with provider groups. Some payers have already succeeded in reducing commonly overused services using these approaches. Longer term, payers should accelerate the development and adoption of value-based payment models that base reimbursement on patient-centered outcomes. Providers practicing within these models have been more successful in responding to the pandemic and weathering the, the ongoing economic uncertainties. Moreover, the, the resources and supports offered by these models are some of the very same capabilities required to el eliminate low value care, such as strong leadership and culture for value-based care, robust IT and data analytic capabilities, and aligned financial incentives and accountability. Payers should also engage consumers through this process adopting value-based insurance design principles that increase patient cost sharing for low value services while decreasing cost sharing for high value services. For example, if seeing a physical therapist via telehealth over uh, orthopedist in an office offers a safer high value pathway, then benefit design should reflect this higher value through lower copayments. Payers should also prioritize lower copays for high value services, particularly those imperative to provide during a pandemic, such as COVID-19 testing and preventive and mental health services, while increasing cost sharing for low value, higher risk services like spinal fusion or other unnecessary uh, surgical procedures. In terms of policymakers, they could create opportunities for providers, health systems and, pay and payers to pilot innovative models that reduce low value care and reflect the new COVID context, integrating telehealth and a wider range of healthcare professionals. For example, CMS could direct additional COVID relief funding uh, to hospitals and providers who agree to pilot new models of care and or who participate in alternative payment models. In addition, uh, CMS could work with healthcare providers and payers to determine which telehealth flexibility should stay in place, as well as encourage states to adopt new strategies to support home and community-based services. Opportunities and supports to address social drivers of health and advance clinical and social care integration should also be part of these efforts. Employers also play a key role in building a new normal. They can accelerate the adoption of tools already used successfully by employers to limit wasteful care, such as centers of excellence programs. Here, employees pay reduced or no out-of-pocket costs in return for using a high-quality institution or providers with a demonstrated track record of delivering appropriate care. Walmart, for example, has reduced inappropriate joint and spine surgery for its enrollees by about 20 to 50 percent using this approach. High value provider networks linked to employer ben benefit design is also a way to encourage enrollees to see providers that perform well on quality metrics while encouraging low performers to improve and can be applied to a range of therapeutic areas with potential to reduce unnecessary care such as orthopedics, oncology, uh, cardiology, among others. Finally, for patients, while tele telehealth has made uh, patient-provider uh, interactions significantly easier and safer in the pandemic. Patients really need help and support in distinguishing needed services from those that are unnecessary. Shared decision-making strategies or decision aids can help facilitate these discussions and have been found to result in patients choosing less of in invasive treatments. Education is, of course, also important. Ideally, ideally uh, delivered uh, through a multi-pronged communication engagement strategy 
that includes different opportunities to educate patients and, and really set expectations about low value tests and treatments uh, through mechanisms like uh, you know, education during uh, the actual uh, office visits or conversations in the waiting room through posters or, or TV screen messages and with, uh, with uh, take-home reading materials as well. It may also be helpful to utilize behavioral economic approaches to, to nudge patients away from low value and towards high value care. To that end, uh, with all of these approaches, it is important to duly um, discuss and encourage high value care while stressing the, the importance of reducing low value care, really to build trust with patients and avoid concerns about rationing withholding need, needed care. And to center these conversations and strategies around um, the benefits and harms to individual patients. Patient engagement will be critical to building and maintaining trust in new care, in new care approaches used in and beyond the COVID era. So just to close, um, to support all of the aforementioned steps, we need more research on the impacts of low value care elimination or reduction during the pandemic. Part of the challenge of reducing low value care to date is that we lack sufficient evidence on what are the most important drivers of its use and the benefits or unintended consequences of reducing or eliminating it. The pandemic provides a sort of natural experiment to better understand these drivers and the short and long-term impacts of eliminating low value care on health outcomes, quality of care and costs. Such evidence could, could better pinpoint situations where care is unnecessary or inappropriate in certain populations, settings or circumstances which would provide valuable insights on opportunities for, for broader care redesign. With this evidence, we should be more informed and empowered to identify, develop, and implement effective de-implementation strategies. More supports are needed, such as tools and resources, to really help stakeholders across the healthcare system with low value care reduction and make it the right and easy decision. Education is important, but not sufficient. Such su supports might include more tools or resources to help stakeholders measure and track a broader range of low value care services. Um, also include information on and support for shared decision-making and toolkits or checklists to develop a roadmap for planning different phases of de-implementation and the capabilities and actions required at each stage. As previously discussed, um, more payment and delivery reforms are also required that align with these new normal goals. Overall, it will be important that low value care reduction efforts are not a silo effort, but are integrated into broader care transformation strategies. More uh, experimentation and evaluation of strategies used to support high value care and deter use or reintroduction of low value care should also be pursued. To that end, we need more evidence on what works in terms of reducing low value care. We have some evidence that multi-component interventions are most impactful, but what, what are the most effective strategies incorporated therein remains somewhat unclear. We also need more opportunities for stakeholders to share experiences and success stories of uh, successful low value care de-implementation, de much, like, much like this learning network. And finally, more uh, political will and collective action is needed as a pandemic has really highlighted their power to drive rapid changes. Leadership, collaboration, and nimble clinical practices and supportive policies will be central to tackling low value care in the short and long term. So with that, thank you so much for your time and attention.